And you, they have, they're doing, you said we don't have anybody here doing it, right? Yep. And that's it, you're done. So when it's done, I'll, I'll be down here anyway, so obviously. Any problems? Cycling just on? Yes, we see it. What is he doing? Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> He's changed. Yeah, the first year was like all about education, right? Really is his passion. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
ready to get started, uh, we're ready over here. I'm going to get started. My name is Tiffany Cole, and today I'm going to present my uh, research on line one expression by Loci. Just to give a brief background on my uh, research experience, I spent about three summers at the Cleveland Clinic investigating synergistic risk factors between high blood pressure and um, hydrocephalus. By conducting a retrospective chart and MRI review, I spent two years studying the alpha sleeping overexpressing mouse model of Parkinson's disease at Georgetown University. And I spent three years studying the small regular, small molecular uh, regulators of aging in the rheumatoid, the elegans worm. Now I'm in the physician scientist program here at Tulane University, uh, working on my MD and PhD degree. In my PhD, I am using a bioinformatics approach to study the expression of a repetitive L1 uh, retro element in a variety of normal tumor cells and tissues. So that segues me into giving you a little bit of background about the uh, L1 and its replication cycle. So the L1 repetitive retro element is a 6 kb element that makes up about 17% of the whole human genome. There are about 500,000 copies, though most of these copies are truncated or defective, and it is estimated that only 20 to 100 L1s are intact and active in a given individual. Here I've got a schematic of the replication cycle. You can see here that um, L1s are transcribed off their own promoter into mRNA. Two proteins, the ORF1 protein and ORF2 protein are expressed from the mRNA in the cytoplasm. And uh, the, pro the proteins bind to the L1 mRNA. This ribonucleic protein re-enters the nuclease where an endonuclease and reverse transcriptase from the ORF2 protein reinserts the L1 into the genome through a process called uh, target prime reverse transcription, or TPRT. 
Now, L1s have been recorded to be involved in about uh, 200 cases of germline diseases, like dystrophy, um, and it's been established that L1 insertions can cause disease, at least germline disease. But recent, uh, recent movement in the field is to, is to try and investigate um, L1 activity in uh, somatic diseases like cancers. It's been shown that there's increased L1 expression and retrotransposition um, in many epithelial cancers, ranging from pancreatic cancers and gastrointestinal cancers. And one study even showed that 50% of 244 tumors across 12 different epithelial cancer types had new somatic retrotransposition events compared to matched normal samples. So my project, what, what I'm doing, what I'm interested in, is identifying which specific L1s are being expressed in somatic diseases. The identified expressed L1s could be used as markers for disease or could inform treatment for disease. So this is my approach. The first thing I do when I get my sample is I cytoplasmically extract RNA with a soft detergent like digitonin or agapal, and I use trizol. Now, I really want to emphasize that it's how important it is that I get the cytoplasmic RNA. I'm going to go back to this slide looking at the replication cycle. So oftentimes, if you remember, I said that there were 500,000 copies of mostly defective L1s. Those L1s can be found in the introns and are often expressed in mRNA form in other genes found within the introns of those genes. So there are um, mRNA genes before they're spliced and processed in the nucleus that contain L1. So I'm not interested in looking at those defective L1s. I'm more interested in looking at the complete and active and intact L1s seen here in the cytoplasm. So I work hard to try and get just the cytoplasmic uh, L1 mRNA, and not the background noise that you see in uh, nuclear mRNA genes. Next, what I do is I send my sample off to be polyase selected and RNA sequenced. We also, that's going down this route of my sequencing approach, and we also select for the 5' UTR of the L1 and its promoter for um, about a 1 kb region, and we uh, do that with a five prime race approach, and then I'll send that off to the Sanger sequence to verify that I have my um, L1 region, my selected L1 region, and then I send it off for pack bio sequencing. Now we use these two sequencing approaches so that they may complement each other and um, correct for biases. So the big, big takeaway from these two different sequencing approaches is that uh, RNA seq, with RNA seq, you get sequencing reads that are about 100 base pairs long. And when you're looking at repetitive elements, it's pretty hard to map um, 100 base pairs to a repetitive, repetitive element that's found throughout the genome. So when I'm doing my RNA-seq analysis, I maybe lose a lot of my uh, mapped sequences and maybe lose some of my ability to identify sequenced um, or uh, expressed L1s. Um, but the PAC bio, because it's able to sequence a thousand base pairs, I'm able to better map it to my uh, my sample, map it to the genome, and identify which L1s are being expressed. Once I have my data sequenced, I have developed this bioinformatics pipeline. With PAC bio, what I do is I demultiplex my reads, I genomically map and align the cDNA reads to L1. I select for reads that have a 99% identity match, I remap stringently, and then I use web to scan to get coverage on the full-length L1 annotation input in Excel. Then with my RNA-seq data, what I do is I align uniquely prepared ends to the human genome, I'll separate the strands, I'll identify uh, reads that are expressed in the correct direction of the L1, and I'll input the mapped reads in Excel and then look in uh, IGB, which is the way to visualize your sequencing data. So this is, a, this is an example of what I do once I have my sequence data input in IGB. <laughs> so what we, what I do is I have all my input, my um, L1s that I have mapped to the human genome that I have identified as being expressed. And when I look at it in IGV, I individually look at each sort of L1 hit to identify, to sort of investigate the environment around, in and around L1 to 
see if I think that L1 is truly being expressed. So this is an example of an L1 hit or read that I would reject because I'll try to explain this here. If you look up top, I have the reference human genome. The genome is being, this gene is being expressed in this direction. The L1 is also within this gene, it's within the intron, and it's being expressed in this direction. Here you have the exon of the gene. And here are my, uh, my reads from my sequence sample. You can see that in this area, I got the hit because there were reads to the L1, but there are reads upstream the L1 and reads that align to this exon of um, this gene. So most likely this example of an L1 is not at all related to L1 being expressed off its own promoter, but it's uh, being expressed because it's within the intron of another gene and being expressed off the promoter of that gene. Now below, I have an example of something that I would accept. Here you can see that this L1 going in this direction is not within any gene and there are no um, sequencing reads upstream. I just see sequencing reads within the L1. And so I say that this is a true L1. In my project, I have um, used this RNA-seq and PacBio data or this PacBio approach for normal and cancerous tissues and cells in human samples, mouse, rat, and monkey. And today I'm gonna to show you a little bit of the data I have from prostate tumor cell lines. What I have here are five different prostate tumor cell lines. I have PC3, DU145, LINCAP, BCAP, and C42. Just to give you a little bit of background and information about these cell lines, LINCAP is well differentiated and has low metastatic potential. C3 is, has high metastatic potential, DU145 has moderate metastatic potential, VCAP um, and C42 have high metastatic potential. And so here in this graph, what I'm showing, each uh, dot you see here is a loci that I identified to be truly expressed after my um, pipeline and curations. And I have it uh, in red here is LINCAP, one loci that was really highly expressed in LINCAP. So that was interesting. And then here you can see some loci that are expressed in uh, multiple of the prostate tumor cell lines. Down here, I have the example in IGB of what the um, highly expressed L1 loci look like. In that LINCAP up here, this here, you can just see that this is a ton of expression and I, I rarely see this much, this much expression in one uh, specific L1. Here, I'm looking at just the L1 loci being expressed in multiple prostate tumor cell lines. If I look at my reads normalized housekeeping genes, uh, most of them don't have any overlap, but some loci have overlap. I saw overlap in two prostate tumor cell lines, three prostate tumor cell lines, and four prostate tumor cell lines. And down here, I'm showing, here's an example of one L1 locus that was expressed in three of the different tumor cell lines. Here, this is the L1 going in this direction. These pink reads go show that they're being expressed in this direction. And then here actually in this blue or purple, that means that the reads are being expressed to my right. <laughs> that makes sense because the L1s have an antisense promoter at the uh, five time UTR. And so this is just showing that there is expression so some of the challenges that I face is uh, the, my um, challenge to, to cut back on background noise from the truncated and defective L1s expressed off other gene promoters. I've been working with that by trying to change the detergents and the detergents, and we've sort of finessed that so we have our protocol set and ready. And then my next big challenge is streamlining my bioinformatics approach. Manually curating all my reads takes a long time, so maybe I can add a couple rules to my pipeline that can make my manual curation work a little bit less. That's what I'm working on right now. And next steps, all these groups that I showed you, um, L1s actually have different subfamilies based on the age, and so there are subfamilies that are younger and more likely to be active. So my next step is to look at these reads and um, analyze them according to subfamily. Once I have a few more biological replicates, I'll do a statistical correlation analysis. And um, I have to pack biosequence these highly expressed prostate tumor cell lines. And then once I have my identified 
verified L1 that I'm interested in investigating whether or not they're expressed in prostate tumors, I will conduct a case control study looking at the presence of the identified expressed L1 loci in 1,000 prostate tumor samples, matched normal samples using an SMP PCR protocol, and we will correlate L1 expression with prostate tumor. Well, that's what I've presented today, and that's my uh, my update. <laughs> Any questions? Hi, this is Emily Levitan at UAB. Uh, I was wondering um, how you uh, interpreted the fact that you saw some uh, L1 sequences that were um, we're seeing across cell lines. Um, are you are those sort of the ones you're going to target? Are you going to target the highly expressed or both? We're going to we're going to focus on the ones that are expressed across the multiple variety of cell lines, and then um, maybe we can try that. Maybe a next step to look further into it would be to look at the highly expressed. Look at just this highly expressed one that we found, or investigate more why that uh, specific cell line has one really highly expressed L1, but Right now, we're focusing on the ones that have overlap. Thank you. We'll <laughs> load up the next one. Do you have a you can. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Ah, so odd. Uh, all right. My name is Marguerite Matosian. I'm going to be giving a talk today, or my update is on um, using patient-derived xenografts as a translational model to study triple negative breast cancer. Long title: Tumor Genesis and Metastasis. All right, so a little about myself. Um, I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I uh, came as far south as possible. I got my BA in chemistry uh, with a concentration in biochemistry from Kalamazoo College. Um, after college, I took a year and I worked as a research technician in a cancer, head and neck cancer metastasis laboratory at the University of Michigan. Um, I worked under an MD PhD mentor and she uh, inspired me to apply to all sorts of MD-PhD programs, and I ended up here at Tulane. So um, I'll just jump right in. Breast cancer is an impactful disease, not only in the US, but worldwide. Um, you've probably heard the statistic before, but one in eight women in the US will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Um, and 85% of breast cancers occur in women uh, that don't have a family history of breast cancer. So it's not just a hereditary disease, as a lot of people think, with the BRCA1 positivity, um, but it is a really highly, um, there's many genetic mutations that are unknown in this disease. It's very complex. Because it's so complex, it's broken down mainly, there's different um, categories of breast cancer, or ways to categorize, but mainly it's divided into three um, large categories, hormone receptor positive, that's your estrogen, um, progesterone receptor positive tumors that constitutes most of them. They have targeted therapies against them. Um, there's also this HER2 amplified subset, that's a smaller subset, 15 to 20%. There's also targeted therapies against that. And then there's this uh, kind of nastier, more aggressive subset, the triple negative. These don't have um, receptors on their surface or uh, otherwise that can be targeted or that are not known to be targeted. And that's about 12 to 15 percent of all breast cancers. Now this number goes up. Um, it's more prevalent in African-American women. It goes up from 12 percent to about 30 percent of all breast cancer cases. Um, and it's very, it's clinically aggressive. So there's high rates of metastasis, recurrence, and, and a high propensity to develop this chemo resistance. 
to resistance to chemotherapy and other therapeutics. So, um, and the other uh, figure, it's, uh, I'm just trying to show that the complexity of this disease. So within triple negative breast cancer, there's multiple different subtypes um, uh, depending on different features. So you can have a more aggressive disease, more mesenchymal, it's called, um, more basal-like, which is kind of in the middle, and then a more luminal subsite, subtype, subsite. Specifically, uh, why do we care? So in Louisiana, we have one of the highest um, incidence rates of triple negative breast cancer. Interestingly enough, this has been thought to do due to the African-American population and the um, large rates of obesity. Um, studies have come out even more specifically that in New Orleans, um, in the greater New Orleans area, there's increasing rates of mortality and there's higher rates, uh, incidence rates of poorly differentiated diseases. So this gives us a unique population specific to New Orleans to study this really aggressive clinically disease. So one of the major obstacles in triple negative breast cancer research is that there are no clinically approved small molecule inhibitors that are specific for triple negative breast cancer. This poses um, a really big issue because they have to use systemic chemotherapies mostly for triple negative, which is uh, the number one cause of death. Um, aside from meta metastatic disease. So um, going to the lab side, um, one of the limitations of using cell lines, which are the uh, most commonly used models to discover um, triple negative breast cancer therapeutics is um, using cell lines, right? So the, if you inject a cell line into a mouse, it doesn't recapitulate the complexity of the disease. Specifically with triple negative breast cancers, they're um, very heterogeneous. So they have a lot of multiple tissue types involved. There's interactions with other um, cell types and the microenvironment itself. So just injecting cell lines into mice doesn't really recapitulate what you see in patients. Now, um, a lot of uh, research groups around the nation and the world are using these patient-derived xenograft models. So the idea is to use the patient's own tumor, bring it into the bench side, do whatever research you need to do uh, with therapeutic discovery, as I'll show you later, and then the idea would be to bring it back to the patient. So it's this whole era, new era of personalized medicine. And the whole concept is that using a patient's own tumor recapitulates not just the cellular composition, but also the tumor stroma and the microenvironment. So this is showing that um, again, around the nation, a lot of studies are using models to look at metastatic drivers, characterize the tumors, look at clonal evolution within the tumor itself. So a lot of different aspects. So I'll just go through. Um, I kind of, it's a large project, so I divide it up into three different uh, specific aims. So first, I'm going to talk about establishing a biobank of these uh, triple negative EDX specimens from hospitals in the greater New Orleans area. So briefly, our workflow is we work with LSU and Tulane hospitals um, to acquire patient samples, usually from mastectomies or biospecimens, and then we, um, whatever we can get from that sample, we can propagate it up in mice. We can look at the tumor histology, do genomic analyses, of course, cryopreserve for future use, um, and we can make 2D and 3D models. We can create our own primary and secondary cell. Line. And then, um, so we have multiple models for that first specific aim, which I'll touch on later. The second aim gets a little heavy. Now we have to characterize unique features of the tumor. So why is it so important that we use these models? Um, so in this, as I go through these, don't focus on the specific models, but the potential applications. So what we can do is we can track tumor growth in mice over time and see how it correlates with um, the tumor genesis patterns in the patients. So slower growing tumors we see are slower growing in mice as well. That's really important to show. Also over consecutive passages in mice, you are going to get an infiltration of um, mouse cells. It's just inevitable. So it's important to show that between lower and higher passage tumors, you get the same tumor composition. The tumor hasn't changed. You can do this looking at genomics as well um, and PCR studies. 
This is showing histology. So it's important to show the histology of the tumor doesn't change over time. Although you do lose some stromal characteristics, it's a whole different thing. Um, what you can also do is subcategorize the tumor. So triple negative breast cancer, as I mentioned, is very heterogeneous. So there are different ways to categorize it. So you can name it as a clot in low, which is a more aggressive tumor, compared to different um, clot in low cell lines, or you can characterize it as clot in high. Um, you can also observe uh, the metastatic potential of these VX tumors, which is also very important for therapeutic discovery research. Um, you can look at the lungs, you can harvest the lungs, liver, and the brain of the mice, and look at circulating tumor cells in the blood um, at the endpoint of after you terminate the PDX. So when you pass the PDX after it gets too big, you harvest these organs. So this is showing one of our more recent, really uh, chemo-resistant models. So that's kind of this new wave that we're trying to work with the hospitals to acquire these specimens that are very chemo resistant. So on average, it takes about 100 to 200 days to establish your first PDX. In this patient, you can see it took 17, 23 days uh, for that tumor to just jump off. And that, that's insane. Um, so the patient actually expired a week after resection. Um, so unfortunately, we couldn't bring it back to her. But it shows that this model is great if you want to study therapeutic research in a short time frame. So this, we also discovered that this PX was a very rare breast cancer subtype. Um, it's called metaplastic breast cancer. So there are multiple different cell types within this PDX model. So we can um, sub-clone out these different populations and figure out how they all interact with each other. So that's a project we're working on now. Um, and then finally, this uh, it's important to show to correlate metastasis in mice with metastasis in the patient. This is highly metastatic in the patient, um, we discovered after the fact. And in our mice, we also discovered there are large lesions forming in the lungs and the liver. And finally, another application of this, or it's important to ca uh, categorize stem cell-like populations. So um, tumors, breast cancer, primary breast cancer tumors that have high propensity to metastasize usually have high levels of circulating tumor cells. Um, so you can look at, you can enrich for these in cell culture by making mammospheres, or you can um, analyze the blood itself from the mice um, to evaluate the uh, amount of circulating tumor cells in the blood. So higher levels of circulating tumor cells correlates with higher rates of metastasis. So finally, I'll narrow this down um, and just touch on a couple projects in which we demonstrate applications of these models. So it's important to show um, that we can use these models to aid in therapeutic discovery research. So, oh, um, so in this is using a, a therapy that we've shown and demonstrated in our lab is effective in cell lines, but this was before we had this PBX model. So these next few figures are recapitulating um, the results that we've seen in cell lines in our PDX samples. So we can show it in our explants. You take um, explants treat out of the mice, treat them, treat the tumor pieces itself with the therapies, and then you analyze the um, genomic characteristics of those uh, pieces of tumor. We can also, there you go, you can implant pieces into mice and then treat the mice themselves. You can also look at tumor genesis from that aspect. We can look at metastasis and quantify um, rates of lung, or quantify metastatic lesions in lungs and liver. So um, this is a paper we're working to get out. Another novel method, um, so this is we're working with uh, Bruce Fennell and his lab in the bioengineering department at LSU. And what they do is they take uh, the triple negative tumors themselves, strip the tumors of all cellular components, and then in re-inject cells back into the tumor that are either genetically ma manipulated or um, changed in some way, and then implant that scaffold into the mice. So instead of just injecting tumor cells into mice, you're maintaining that tumor scaffold, which is really important. And we've uh, had great success with this in various models. So this is just this 2K1 model showing that you can decellularize the tissue, but you keep that collagen um, in extracellular matrix. And then with another model here, we show that you can look at relative um, collagen content. 
So high uh, levels of type 1 collagen are indicative of a more invasive tumor, and high levels um, and collagen type 3 is indicative of a more benign, less invasive tumor. The red and orange are, um, quanti are quantifiable for collagen 1 fibers. Yellow green under polarized filter are for collagen type 3. You can look at various levels of collagen before and after treatment as well. These are a list of our current specimens. Um, we have more in progress, but uh, we do have a large, or we're trying to create a larger biobank. Um, but there are, oh, good. <laughs> Just to recapitulate the specific aims, uh, we aim to establish a biobank of these um, patient dried xenograft triple negative tumor specimens from hospitals that are specific to the greater New Orleans area. Um, and then characterize unique features of these tumors, and then demonstrate applications of these models in therapeutic discovery research. So hopefully we can find um, aid in discovery of novel therapeutic targets in the negative. And we um, can distribute these models throughout different laboratories in the South. So what, what's the importance of all this? How does this benefit our patients? So it addresses this unique triple negative patient population that's so specific to not only Louisiana, but New Orleans. Um, and we're the first like actual PDX distribution biobank of these triple negative specimens in Louisiana. We distribute to other Tulane laboratories, LSU, Xavier. Um, and then this gives us a translational model so aside from bench side, bringing it back to the patient, a translational model to study a really complex and heterogeneous disease, it's a necessary model to identify um, therapeutic targets in triple negative. So next steps, um, we're always working on biobanking and propagating up more specimens. It's important to show various degrees of heterogeneity, especially in the subset. Um, we want to represent more of these chemo-resistant patient populations. We do need to be and we're working with LSU to perform RNA sequencing on the tumors in the cell line um, to track mutations over time and identify uh, tumorigenic and metastatic drivers, and then perform these um, ex vivo and in vivo analyses that I've shown you with various models and various drugs to confirm this therapeutic discovery aspect. There are quite a few challenges. Um, so as you can see, it's hard to focus <laughs> on specific projects. Um, so that's one thing we're working on. And we need to hire a technician. One day I need to graduate. So we need to hire a technician to take over the animal maintenance aspect of this project. Um, that's the most time consuming part. And then we are collaborating with so many laboratories um, to distribute these specimens, it brings up a whole Another aspect of um, juggling all these labs. So here's a few of our collaborators, and um, uh, thanks for the uh, appreciate this opportunity with this grant to fund our research. That's it. Yay! <laughs> Any questions? I love the delay. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Yes. Hey, I'm Sandhya from, from UAB. Um, so I had a question more about sort of the, the bedside component of this. Are patients typically consented to get their tissue and sort of what are their perspectives like in terms of being, you know, going through this process? Is that, I don't know if that's something you have experience with, but. Oh yeah. Um, so we work with the so LCRC them. They consent to patients. Um, as a medical student, I can go in and consent with them so they understand that I'm actually taking their tumors and doing research with them. Um, and then we work with this breast cancer survivors group. So we um, give talks, I mean, less in depth than this. Uh, to the survivors and their um, friends in the hospitals about the research that we do. And we do get a very good feedback. Um, I think patients want to know that, especially breast cancer survivors or even ones who don't survive, that, they're, that their um, mortality is going towards something else, right? So we, we had a couple of patients who didn't consent. Um, they just didn't feel comfortable, but we definitely do sit down with them and explain the whole process. What percentage of um, tumor samples can you successfully uh, make into these uh, xenograft models? 
Oh, great question. So, um, in the past few years, there have been a lot of advances in science, obviously. There's a higher concentration nitrogel that's coming out. Um, so, our, I would say, like three years ago, we were at like 15% mm, success rate. Um, and then now we have like 60 or 70% success rate. So, we've tried about 25 PDX models. As you can see, 10 are truly successful. There's a couple in progress still. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's higher for triple negative than for ER and PR positive breast cancers. Those rates are really low. They drop to like 2% success rates. But yeah. Have you looked at um, patient characteristics that are associated with whether or not the model is successful? Uh, like, metastatic disease? Yeah, yes. Um, oh, absolutely. So we, we get the path reports when we get the PDX model. Um, and then we we actually don't look at it until the first passage of mice because we don't, it's blinded that way. Um, so once we harvest the organs, we process, we do see changes. Um, like if we see a metastatic disease in the mice, it correlates with a high rate of metastatic disease in the patient. Of course, there's some discrepancies. Um, some of our earlier models that are pre-neoadjuvant therapy, we see metastatic disease in the mice, but not in the patients. That could be because the disease in the patients didn't have time to progress long enough to metastasize. Um, but tumor genesis is usually always consistent with what we see in the patients with mice. Um, but absolutely, and that's really important to show for all these manuscripts. I have a question about the chemo resistant, sorry, the chemo resistant yeah, no. xenografts. Um, is that after the xenografts implanted in the mice that they showed they're chemo resistant, or are these the patients that get neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then their, their disease doesn't restage or regress and then that you implant those? And then yeah. how are you going to address the patients that get neoadjuvant chemotherapy and their disease continues to progress or not surgical candidates? Are you able to get biopsies of those? Tumors, because they're not able to go to surgery, or if you're kind of just waiting on those patients, because those would be the ones that would be the most, you know, this disease would be the most progressive, most aggressive. I'm so sorry. So first off, just the chemo-resistant one, is it the, you put them in the xenograft in the mice and test the mice against therapies, and those oh. are resistant, or is it a patient that gets neoadjuvant chemotherapy and they don't restage or downstage, so they become chemo-resistant xenografts? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, we do get the um, uh, the PDX. Sorry, the tumors themselves are from a patient who developed chemo resistance. They already had like eight cycles of chemo. It didn't work. The tumor came back, but the tumor just wasn't um, responsive to the chemotherapy. So it is uh, chemo resistant at the um, when we first get the PDX. So when the patient was chemo resistant at the time of resection. Now we're starting this new project in which we get primary biopsy specimens. Um, so we get a pre and then we follow up with the patient. If, they're, if they get chemotherapy and their um, tumor comes back or it's not responsive, then from the same patient, we would get a follow-up post-neoadjuvant chemo-resistant specimen. Um, so then we can track changes in uh, over time in that really aggressive tumor. That's a great question. Um, yeah, we don't develop chemo-resistance in our lab. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. It depends on. Maybe. Oh, the question was. Uh, I don't really know. Okay, so um, what's okay? What's the timeline um, from bench to bedside, pretty much? So once we get a patient's tumor, what's the timeline in bringing information back to that patient? That's actually something uh, one of the biggest obstacles in PDX research right now. A lot of institutions with a lot larger cancer centers um, and a lot more funding are can quickly bring that back to the patient. Um, 
because they put in multiple mice or have different ways to make the tumor grow faster. But here we look at different aspects of the tumor. So we can look at the cell lines that we create, which tends to grow a little faster than the tumor itself sometimes. Um, we can take patient explants, so the tumor pieces in lab, treat them, and then give it back to the patient. Um, so we're trying to find ways around that. And that turnaround time is usually within a month, or if we're lucky, or um, up to three to four months, if the PDX even grows. So you're not even sure if the patient tumor is going to take it out. So that is a risk with all this research and one of the major obstacles. Um, but yeah, something we're struggling with. Of course. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rachel and today I'm going to talk to you about my research looking at obesity altered adipose stem cells and how they contribute to triple negative breast cancer, metastasis, and Marguerite's talk was actually a great introduction because we will be using one of the patient drive xenografts that she just talked to you about. Um, so first a little bit about me, I was born and raised in Bozeman, Montana. And then I moved down to New Orleans and never left. So I did my undergrad and now I'm, did a master's degree and now I'm working um, on my MD PhD at Tulane um, and loving the South and the weather and not having snowy winters. <laughs> um, so a little bit of background for you. I know we just had a breast cancer talk, so you're all a little more familiar, but Breast cancer is the most common cancer in women worldwide. One in eight women in the U.S. will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime, and it's the second leading cause of cancer deaths in women. Um, there are various risk factors that contribute to this disease. Um, there are some non-modifiable risk factors, increasing age, genetics, and physiological factors, but also modifiable risk factors, and this is sort of where my lab is studying we're specifically interested in obesity, but there are other modifiable risk factors that can also contribute to the development or progression of this disease. Um, and a little bit of background of breast cancer, as Marguerite sort of already introduced you to, there are several subtypes of breast cancer when we are looking at their um, receptor expression. Um, there's estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, which accounts for the majority of cases. Additionally, there's um, HER2 amplification, but then there's also triple negative breast cancers, which doesn't express estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2. And so these cancers don't have targeted therapies and are much more difficult to address in clinic. So triple negative breast cancers have worse clinical outcomes. In fact, um, the five-year survival for triple negative breast cancer was 70 77% compared to 93% for all other breast cancers. Um, and triple negative breast cancers are more likely to recur and metastasize. And additionally, the lack of therapeutic or the lack of targetable receptors limits therapeutic options. So there's a critical need to study how modifiable risk factors promote triple negative breast cancer progression to provide a better understanding of how to prevent or treat this aggressive disease. So a little bit of background of how obesity interacts with um, triple negative breast cancer. Um, this Kaplan-Meier curve, I'm not sure if you can read this key because it's a little small, but these green lines represent um, patients who have a BMI of greater than 25, and the blue lines are patients with a BMI of less than 25. And for those of you who aren't familiar with um, BMI regulations um, and how the CDC defines obesity, uh, BMI of less than 25 is considered lean or a healthy weight. Between 25 and 30 is considered overweight, and then a BMI of greater than 30 is considered obese. Um, so looking at disease-free survival in this first graph and overall survival in the second graph, 
we see that patients who have a BMI of greater than 25 have um, significantly worse outcomes. And then I probably don't have to tell a group of physicians and scientists in the South that obesity rates are on the rise. So when we look at the prevalence of obesity in 2011, we see that there's a lot of green and yellow in this graph, but then as we move forward um, all the way up to 2016, um, more oranges and even this dark red has emerged and the prevalence of obesity is on the rise. This trend is not slowing down. And so there are gonna be more and more patients in clinic who are obese. And so it's really crit critical to understand how obesity is driving this disease to really see if we could intervene somehow with maybe a therapeutic precision medicine. So just to kind of recap before I go into my data, um, studies have demonstrated that there is a decreased disease-free survival and overall survival for women with triple negative breast cancer who are obese. And there's also studies that demonstrate um, an increased rate of metastasis in these patients. Um, however, the obesity-mediated cellular drivers of increased metastasis and disease progression remain to be determined. So we plan to address this gap by identifying mechanisms through which TNVCs are educated to obesity-altered adipose stem cells, to a pro-metastatic phenotype, and to promote tumor progression. Um, and our aim one is to determine the pro-tumorigenic influences on lean and obese ASCs on triple negative breast cancer. And aim two is to characterize the effects of lean and obese ASCs on metastasis of triple negative breast cancer and evaluate an underlying mechanism. So I know I just threw adipose stem cells at you, which many of you may or may not be familiar with, but this is the cell type that my lab uses to um, study how obesity is promoting breast cancer. And we do this for a few reasons, but first let me back up and tell you how we get our adipose stem cells. So we get adipose stem cells from liposuction or plastic surgery specimens of adipose tissue that would otherwise be medical waste. Um, and we can wash, wash this tissue and digest it with a collagenase digestion to release the stromal vascular fraction, which contains various stromal and immune components from the adipose tissue. And from that, we can culture out the adipose stem cells, which um, in bright field, you can see have a very mesenchymal morphology. And these are stem cells that they can differentiate among the mesenchymal lineages shown here, adipogenesis and osteogenesis. But adipose stem cells also can be recruited to sites of inflammation and are really a potent immunomodulator. And so that's why we selected these cells is we know that they can go from the fat tissue to sites of inflammation. So we thought they would be a key candidate to be recruited from the adipose tissue of the breast recruited to the breast tumor site. Additionally, um, it's been studied that adipose stem cells have altered biology when they're isolated from obese fat tissue compared to lean fat tissue. Um, so this study that looked at 189 donors saw that there was a decreased ability of these adipose stem cells to differentiate when they were isolated from obese adipose tissue. And additionally, um, in this study, we see that obese adipose stem cells also are more pro-inflammatory. So when I said that these cells are immunomodulatory, when they get to a site of inflammation, usually they would secrete anti-inflammatory properties to promote regeneration but the obese adipose stem cells um, secrete a myriad of factors that are actually more pro-inflammatory. Um, so we hypothesized that these cells could be a key mediator of how obesity is promoting breast cancer tumor progression. So I'm gonna go over a little bit of the data from one of the experiments we've been working on. And these are our three groups, just to introduce you. We looked at human triple negative breast cancer by itself and compared them to tumors grown with six pooled donors of lean adipose stem cells from patients with a BMI of less than 25 and compared them also to triple negative breast cancer that was grown with human obese adipose stem cells um, in the tumor matrix gel. And the patient-derived xenograft model that we used for our human breast cancer model was a called 2K1 
and this was from a 59 year old African American woman who had triple negative invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, and so as Marguerite sort of just introduced you, this is a tumor that came from a patient and then was passaged in mice. And then at one passage, we set up this experiment and introduced our groups and introduced the adipose stem cells to um, the tumors at that point. So the first thing we looked at was tumor growth to address our aim one of if adipose stem cells are promoting tumor growth. And we saw that there was no difference in the growth or weight of these tumors across the time of the experiment. Um, and when we look to see and evaluate these tumors for proliferation and markers of angiogenesis in CD31, we found that, again, there was no difference in proliferation or KI67, um, and also no difference in um, vasculature in these tumors. We also wanted to evaluate um, these these tumors and see if there was any increase in metastatic potential. So first we looked at circulating tumor cells and we found that mice that had um, patient-derived xenografts implanted with obese ASCs had a significant increased number of human cells in circulation. And when we characterized this population further, we found them to be um, enriched for the cancer stem cell markers CD44 positive, CD24 negative. Um, Additionally, we looked at epithelial cell adhesion molecule expression, and we saw that circulating in the mice of the, the mice that had triple negative breast cancer with obese adipose stem cells, we saw um, that there was an enrichment for CD326 positive cells, but that this population was depleted in the tumors of these mice. So this suggests that um, obese adipose stem cells are uh, upregulating the epithelial to mesenchymal transition in these tumors and promoting a more metastatic phenotype. So after we characterized the circulating tumor cells in the blood, we wanted to see if this actually correlated to increased number of gross metastases, and it did. Um, and we saw significantly increased lung metastasis in the mice that had tumors grown with obese ASCs. So just to summarize, adipose stem cells do not affect the proliferation or tumor growth of triple negative breast cancer patient-derived xenografts, but they did increase the circulating tumor cells and enriched for cancer stem cell markers. Um, and finally, they showed greater metastasis to the lung. And this is really significant because 90% of tumor-related deaths are due to metastasis. So this work aims to help improve patient outcomes by identifying pathways through which obesity altered adipose stem cells promote metastasis. So this is kind of where we're going next is looking at how this is happening. Um, so some of our next steps, patient-derived xenografts are great and um, provide a really novel and emerging um, breast cancer research tool, but Many people want to see that recapitulated in an established breast cancer cell line. So that's what we're working on now. And additionally, we're doing in vitro analysis in cell culture dishes, um, looking at proliferation assays to see if these adipose stem cells are promoting proliferation in vitro and looking at co-cultures to look at gene expression changes and tease out a mechanism a little more. Um, additionally, we're planning to look at adipose stem cell sacrosome analysis. So we've done a little bit of that, and I showed you that with the um, data of the increased pro-inflammatory, um, the in factors that obese adipose stem cells make, but we haven't done a full proteomic analysis, and so that could also be a key um, piece of data to demonstrate what these cells are providing to the cancer cells that are making them more metastatic. Um, and our long-term goals are to identify drivers in metastasis induced by obese adipose stem cells because identification of these pathways can lead to development of precision therapeutics for this patient population to hopefully improve patient outcomes. So I just wanna thank the members of my lab who've helped work on this, um, the Burrow and Collinsboro lab, as well as their grad student Marguerite who helped us with the patient arrived xenograft model. Um, and then all of you for giving me the opportunity for this talk. Any questions? I have a question. 
question over here. Um, so, is there, do you know if there's any data about any differences in obese adipose stem cells in breast cancer compared to just obese adipose stem cells in general? Like, do they, are there any, is there any data about the differences? In breast cancer? Right, specifically the stem cells in breast cancer patients, are there any differences between, you know, the type of cell activity? So, you mean the cells isolated, the cell, like well, adipose yeah. stems isolated from the fat tissue from a breast cancer patient? Yes. To my knowledge, that study has not been conducted. We have been, as um, the Burrow Lab has been identifying these breast cancer patients, sometimes we can get some surrounding adipose tissue. Um, so we've been trying to build up a biobank to potentially look at that question. It's just difficult to get the samples, so we don't have an accurate representation at the moment. But to my knowledge, no one else has really looked at that. question was just for everyone there um, what's the therapeutic goal of this research um, there is data demonstrating that with weight loss these cells actually do revert back to a lean phenotype so that's one potential um, outcome that could be beneficial to patients but also weight loss is really hard if anyone has ever tried it it's a really difficult thing it's a constant struggle um, and so also identifying the mechanisms and targets to maybe provide a therapeutic intervention for these patients as well, instead of solely relying on weight loss as the only hope as a prevention. But definitely weight loss could prevent many of these um, outcomes. question? Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much.